Good morning, everybody. Let's we'll stand up on our feet. first lesson on the sermon series fanatical how to be about fanatical about god and about jesus and about living and things like that so we're going to be really looking for that jc's going to be talking later on 
So welcome. We'll see you soon. Everybody stand up. just awesome, Matt. That was awesome. Thank you so much for that. Hey, Matt, I got a question to ask you. Well, how's your walk with Jesus? Oh, I'm dead sprinting, brother. You're in a sprint? A dead sprint. Because why? You're a fanatical? Oh, you know it. You wear your shoes. You don't wear shoes. No, you I don't wear, wear crazy shoes, shirts. Brother. You know I don't wear shoes. Because you're a fanatical, aren't you? Yeah. Love you, brother. Brother. Hey, folks, this is the time we get rid of kids. So all you kids, <laughs> going back down there and see uh, the security people there. They'll get you checked in. Those are going to bridge, gonna go that way, and we appreciate you guys being here today. Matt, what happens when your phone starts sideways? Oh, a couple of announcements here. So, uh, 
communication cards. If, you have, if you're needing prayer, if you need something from us, fill out a communicate card and put it in the offering box back in the Welcome Center. Also, there's giving. If you're giving online or giving in person, we really appreciate it. That's what makes the church go. So we really appreciate that. Halloween this year, we're doing it crazy. We are doing crazy. We are going to do two events. One is going to be with the leadership for Trunk or Treat out at uh, Witham Harbor uh, Rec Center. The other one is we as a church are going to go out in the community and we're going to pass candy out off the back of my truck and my trailer. And Matt's going to play and sing up on that while we go. So looking for that, but of course, we need help. We need some candy, lots of candy. So we're just not throwing, you know, pennies out or something like that. So we're doing that. So also with Alt, we are doing a Halloween party with that. And we will also need candy for that too. So we need a bunch of stuff. After church today, there is a meeting about the trip to Haiti. Uh, if you haven't seen the room, the news this morning, there were some issues. We are still going to have the meeting and talk about what that means and where we're going to go with that and how our trip is going to be planned out. So if you're planning on making the trip to Haiti, please meet with us today. If you can't meet us today, meet us next week because we really need to talk about things. Now it's time for Matt again. Time for me again. Well, I don't know what I do now. Call so JC out here? Nah, cool, I got it. All right, good. <laughs> Bye, Ron. Everybody say thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> I come out into the foyer this morning, and I'm like, hey, who's doing, who's doing welcome? And Ron goes, oh, me. I'm like, Ron's doing welcome? Okay. <laughs> Ron did a great job. Now we're getting ready to do some meet and greet time. Oh, look, look at that. Joey's starting the big clap in the back. There you go, Ron. We love you. Yeah, we're going to do meet and greet. So meet and greet is time that we take out of our Sundays so that you guys can meet each other and maybe meet somebody that you don't know. It's an opportunity for you to be like Jesus and meet somebody right where they're at. But I've, it's hard, I know. It can make you nervous to ask somebody new a, a weird question, but I've got the perfect icebreaker question. Are you ready? You're gonna walk up to this new person. And you're gonna say, oh, good morning. I have a great question for you. The winter is on its way. It's getting cold. What's your favorite soup? So go ahead, stand up, meet somebody you don't know, and ask them, what's your favorite soup? He says, you know, when I'm up here preaching, he says, I always write numbers on my, on my sheets so that if it happens and they just go all over the place, I know what order they're in and I don't get screwed up. Tim, thank you, because it just happened to me. <laughs> I thought that transition was going to go a little easier, but whatever. God's got this, because I know I don't. Well, good morning and welcome to the point. 
Really glad to have you here today and to be able to share this message with you. My name is JC. I think most of you here know me, but some may not. Uh, glad to have you online joining us as well, so some of you may not know me. Um, anyway, I'm one of the pastors here, and we are starting a new series that's called Fully Devoted Find... <laughs> Something going on or what? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, associate pastor. <laughs> Anyway, we're starting a new series today called Fully Devoted Fanatical Followers of Who? Ah, that's why I'm pointing at you. Jesus Christ, the man. Absolutely. So the questions I'm going to be addressing today are going to be on basically our relationship with Jesus and how connected we are with him. So why don't we just uh, open up in prayer today, and then uh, let's get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for giving us the opportunity to uh, just have a day where we can all uh, get together and get connected with one another, uh, learn about you, and uh, have you uh, just be able to, we can pour our hearts out to you, and Father, we love that so much. Uh, you've given so much that we just want to give some back to you, uh, even though we're so not worthy, but Lord, uh, be with us all today and teach us something new. Amen. Okay, so each one of us in, has a relationship with someone or many someones in our lives, right? Let's say a spouse, family member, group of friends or something. And within your family unit, your spouse should be, at least should be, your closest relationship, your closest friend. And within your group of friends, you probably have a couple of people that you call your best friends as well, right? You're very close, you're connected all the time, and that's what I wanted to get into. So what do you do to keep that connection close? What do you do to keep your family unit close or your friends close and your enemies closer? No, not really. We're not worried about enemies today. I would say probably staying connected keeping in touch, and just sharing your lives together, right? Um, we, we all have things in our lives. If we don't share our lives with our friends or our family, nobody knows what's going on. And uh, I guess Facebook, I'm not like a big fan of Facebook, but it's there, we use it for things. So we can stay connected that way. But if, if it's all just digital, we only have like this minute piece of what's going on in our lives. We need to really see each other face to face, be with each, be with each other, talk to each other, and really just do life. Um, so when you met your spouse, there probably came a point when you made a conscious decision to, say, define that relationship, right? I mean, you were, you were just going out or whatever, and uh, you, you're thinking, yeah, I really like this person, I'd like to know them a little better. And uh, same thing with your friends, too. But with your spouse especially, relationships don't always come that easy. Sometimes, for some people, they come pretty easy. It's like you meet, and you just know that you were meant to be together, right? And everything else is history. I know that's happened for some of you. But for others, for many, actually, that doesn't really come that easy. Sometimes relationships are pretty messy and complicated and... Uh, it's kind of hard to navigate through some of these things. And so at that point, when you de decide to define your relationship in that status especially, how do you move forward? You know, as you make the conscious, of, well, I really want to move forward, get to know somebody, this person, a little bit better. I really like them, but I'm kind of afraid. I'm, I'm a little scared because I'm afraid they're going to think, well, maybe I'm weird. And maybe they won't like me anymore. Uh, so weirdness is one of my gifts. I love it. I'm all right. I'm fine with that. Most of you know me. I'm a little strange, right? Well, yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, but nor normal isn't really normal. Weird is normal. Because I think if you really get to know people, you're going to find out that at some point, if you can 
get out of this bubble that we're in. We, we have these bubbles around us, right? And we just kind of interact with each other through these bubbles. And we never really get to know, sorry about that, just lost this thing. We never really get to know the inner person of who we really are. And we only let these other people see what we think they want to see in us. And so we never really get to the core of who we are. And then sometime later down the road, eventually, it comes out and the other person goes, wait a minute, I thought you were this person, but you're really this person? Okay, now there's a trust issue. So if we could just get rid of that bubble, right? Right from the beginning, just pop it and let people see the real us. I think we would see that they're like, oh, wow, you're like that too, or you think that way too, or, right? I mean, I've, I've had that happen numerous times. But years later, they think you know, and you're like, oh, wow, that's really cool. I'm like that too. And uh, so uh, we, when, when we pop that bubble, when we get rid of it and just deal with each other from the core of who we really are, defining that relationship becomes more open, transparent, and it's much easier to be able to define that and get closer because now we really know who the real person is. And so I want to share a little story with you from my past. Before I was a believer, before I was saved or born again, I would have told you, if somebody asked me, are you a Christian? I would have said, well, and I did. I'm like, yeah, of course I'm a Christian. Well, what kind of question is that? But the truth is that I really wasn't walking with Jesus. Okay, we say walk with Jesus, but we really should be running, right? And I wasn't even walking with him. Um, I just happened to be out taking a walk, and I was in the vicinity somewhere near him. That was it. But I thought I knew who he was. And so I had a conversation with somebody that I knew, a close friend, who I knew for sure was a devoted follower of Jesus. Uh, her and her husband would talk about church all the time and uh, talk about being involved and going on mission trips and all these sort of things. And it was, we didn't, we didn't, I didn't have that in my life. I mean, I went to church now and then, you know what we call them, but I'm not going to go there. But every once in a while, something would hit me. And so I had this conversation with this person I knew was devoted. And the conversation kind of came around to being involved in church, being with other people that are in church, and doing life together within the context of church. And I'm like, you know what? I, hey, I mean, you're getting a little in my space here, a little in my face. This, there's, a, there's a personal space, and you're in it. You've got to move over here. I don't have to be at church to be involved with Jesus. I don't have to be at church and be involved in church to have a relationship with Jesus because really I can talk to him anywhere, right? That's true. This is somewhat. I want to make that caveat somewhat true. Yes, you can and you should be able to do, church, to do a relationship, have a relationship with Jesus anywhere you are. Stay connected with him anywhere you are. But I tell you what, if you're not involved with other people at church, you're back in this bubble thing because you really are not getting fully connected with the real people that you're in relationship with. But uh, so she, uh, I told her that and uh, she said, well, okay, so I want to get this straight. So you're, you're kind of a lazy Christian. I was like, what? How dare you? You're a Christian. You're supposed to be loving. That does not sound loving to me. Well, and quite frankly, it's probably not the best form of witnessing about God to do that. But we were, you know, fairly close friends, and so she felt pretty confident or pretty comfortable with it saying that. But I was really taken aback. I was like, wow, shame on you. And that, that conversation didn't re really end that well. But some years later, when I did become a true believer in Jesus, and I knew there was a difference in my life, it was... It was day and night when that happened. I knew it. When that happened, I remembered <laughs> that conversation. It took me back. I was like, oh, man, she was right. Totally right. Sorry. But that one's kind of emotional. I'm like, 
I was not devoted to following Jesus. I was doing my own thing, right? I was just out taking a walk, and he happened to be in the vicinity, and that was it. And other people could see that. I couldn't, but they could. But when I truly got to know who Jesus was and what he wanted for my life, it changed. Like I said, it was like day and night. And I wanted to do what he wanted me to. I wanted to get involved. I wanted to do ministry. Uh, I became fanatical. But I've got to say, I became a little over-fanatical. You've, heard, you've, you've seen those Christians, you know, they're beating somebody over the head with the Bible. Well, I became that because I just, I, I, I don't want to be that way, but that's how I was. And I kind of turned people off by that over-fanaticism. And I was on fire for Jesus, but maybe a little too much, you know. And really what it was, was I was trying to follow Jesus on my terms, not Jesus' terms. Jesus gives us the Bible. God gives us the Bible to know exactly what those terms are. And okay, so it's not like a bunch of rules where you're like, okay, I got to follow these stupid rules that God put in front of me. I'm this person, but he wants me to be that that person. Yeah, kind of. But the problem is, we don't know what's best for our lives, right? But he does. And I kind of learned the hard way, so he has to hit me over the head a few times. That's many times, okay? So here we say at the point, we want to make fully devoted followers of Jesus. That's one of our mottos here. So how do you become a fully devoted follower of Jesus? Here's Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to come with me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And the second that goes with this that's not the opposite, but kind of undergirds that, is Matthew 10, 38. And whosoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whew. That's a tough teaching right there. I mean, it really is. It's like, well, you're, you're like that Christian that I knew back then. Not so loving now, are you? But there are... God makes it plain to us exactly what he wants. There's no beating around the bush. There's no guessing what he wants. But most of us say, well, God, what is your will for us? What's your will for me today? What's your will for me in my life? We really don't dig in and see what it is because God has a perfect plan for us. I'm not saying I got to make this step and this step, but he will use everything, right? So this tough teaching is a bit scary, but there's a third verse that goes along with this, I think, that gives it a little more clarity, undergirds it a little better. It says, it's Matthew 11, 28 to 30. It says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. All of you take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble at heart, and you will find rest for yourselves. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. That doesn't sound right, does it? Because we know what happened to Jesus. I think most people did. He died on a cross, horribly, was beaten, uh, tortured. I don't think anybody, any of us would want to go through that. Is that the burden that he's talking about? Probably somewhat. And so in order to become a fully devoted follower of Jesus, what we need to do is bear our own cross, right, and deny ourselves. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to go through life not having anything, not having any fun. I can't go out. I can't do this. I can't play cards. I can't, you know, have a beer. I can't, whatever it is. It's not like God is saying, these are these strict rules, and if you don't follow them, that's it. You fall off the edge. You're done. No. God gives us everything in this life. He made us, and every gift from God is perfect. I mean, perfect. And so he wants us to be able to enjoy life. He didn't send us here to just despise it. But it means dying to the things in ourselves that are not giving glory or honor to God, but giving glory and honor to ourselves. This is being unkind, immoral, rude, 
selfish, prideful, and being overindulgent even. Taking up our cross doesn't mean that you have to look to suffer. Okay, I'm going to wake up today, I'm going to look for some way to suffer so I can be loved by God. That's not what it means. It means being willing to make the daily choices based on what God knows best for your life. And he does. He made, he made you, every molecule in your body. He made. He knows exactly what you need. But we don't, right? And taking on Jesus' yoke is the flip side of that same coin. It's treating others as more important than yourself, being kind and generous, realizing that God's plan is much better than your own, and then being close enough to Jesus, you can actually hear him. He doesn't have to scream at you when he does speak to you. And it's also realizing that this is not our home. I don't mean this church, but this world is not our home. We're just travelers through it. We all die. It's kind of scary to think about that because we don't really like thinking about the morbidity of death, but death is a, death is a crazy thing because where we know we're going to heaven, oh, And so we do want to listen to Jesus because he has got a room built for us in heaven fully. It's got furniture in it, I imagine. Of course, we might not need furniture, but it's fully furnished, ready and waiting for us when that day comes, right? It's waiting there. Just all you have to do, you already have the key. He gave it to you. You just have to believe who he is what he says, trust him, and follow him. It's not that hard, but we do make it hard. So there's a, an old, uh, a old philosopher by the name of Simone de Beauvoir, French philosopher, once said, concerning love, I was reading through this, I was like, I'm not really sure, but at the end I was like, oh my, yeah. You give all, and yet you feel as it costs you nothing. Such love as Jesus displayed costs everything, indeed. But paradoxically, it feels like, it feels as though it costs nothing. In fact, one is made to feel that one actually has gained everything instead. Okay, now there should have been a break here. Well, there's a period, but it's probably not enough. Because the next sentence is, sin takes and never gives. Even though we might reach to possess everything, Jesus said, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. Does that make sense? Who who are we supposed to lose? And I want to go back to that one where the break was. Did you get it? Sin takes and never gives. Sin always takes from you and others. But love gives to others and you and God. The flip side of that would be that love always gives and never takes. Sin becomes this burden because it takes everything from you and leaves you with absolutely nothing. And love leaves you with everything. So back to my story. I was not being loving because I was looking to get something from all I did. I wasn't conscious. It just probably... My surroundings, how I grew up, how I was taught. But I never felt satisfied. But when Jesus grabbed a hold of me, I found that by loving others, I was more than satisfied. I learned that taking on Jesus' yoke is light. And that loving God and loving others is incredible. Now, we have a long way to go. I probably will never reach that. But I'm thankful that God loves me more than I can imagine. Right? I didn't plan this. (laughs) It's so much easier to love than hate. And I want to give you a physical and a visual learning lesson, if I could do that. And if you indulge me, I want you to join into this, okay? I want you to take your hand, put it out in front of you, in a fist, and tight, as tight as you can make it. And don't let up. 
Just keep, and if you can, keep tightening it, right? Yeah, make it really, really tight. Just hard, as hard as you can. And don't, don't think about me, think about your fist. This is really tight, hard. And as you go through this, I want you to think about your heart right here. Keep tightening it. Don't let loose. Okay, now. Now you can let loose. Open your hand. It's really slow, right? It's tough. It's not pliable anymore. You just, you gotta stretch it out to make it feel better. That's your heart. Every time you hold on to unforgiveness or hate or something against somebody else, every time that happens, it your heart atrophies a little more and a little more. In the end, it's not pliable. You can't forgive. You can't love. You can't do what God wants you to do. You can't have relationships. I imagine some of you probably know people in your life like that. They're just, they're hard people to deal with. But when you open that up, forgive, love, your heart becomes more pliable. And it's ready to forgive, it's ready to love. It doesn't hate, you can't help it. All right, so back to our relationships within your family and friends. So what are the next steps after becoming more intimate with each other? Do we just stop there or do we continue to move forward? Do we just stay with our spouse because they're, they're really hot? <laughs> they're great looking? Or they give something to us? Do we stay with our friends because they always do what we want? I mean, that's great and all, but no, we don't always get our way, right? We don't get it, and that's okay. It's all right not to get your way because we give back. And we give back not because we get something, but we give back because we love those people. And we want, to, we, want to, we want to see them feel good. We want to see them be happy and feel like they're loved. And that's why we do it. It gives us a sense of satisfaction, but even more so, it makes those that feel good help us to feel good. It's, it's a mutual thing. And that's what love is. Can you imagine if Jesus only stayed with us because we were perfect? Oh, what does that do to your heart? I know what it does to mine. That's, eh, that's tough. No, as a matter of fact, Colossians 1, 20 and 20 to 22 says, once you were alienated and hostile in your minds because of your evil actions, but now Jesus has reconciled you by his physical body through death. Here's the, good, here's, here's the fanatical part. To present you who is worthless. Sorry, I don't really mean to call you worthless, but you gotta know what I mean. We're not worth God, right? He's perfect. We are not. But Jesus did this to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. Because of his love for us, he chose to take all of our faults and make us spotless before a perfect God who we don't deserve to have on our side, let alone call us children of God. That's crazy. That's fanatical. Jesus took that first step, and all he wants us to do is follow him. He wants us first to believe that he's real, that he is who he says he is, trust him, and follow him. But we get in our own way. We're the ones that stop ourselves from following Jesus, because it's not Jesus doing it. We know what's better for our lives, right? Come on, you have to admit it. You go through your day, and you're like, yeah, it looks like I'm supposed to do it, but I know better. Okay, here's the, here's the kicker, right? This is exactly what got Satan kicked out of heaven for eternity. Whew. Okay, so now we're like Satan. We're probably a little more like that than we think we are. I'm not saying we are him, but we think that way sometimes, unintentionally. But God is perfect and we're not. And so he appointed Jesus mediator between us and God. First Timothy says there's only one God and one mediator between God and humanity. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. 
Um, he takes all of our perfections, Jesus does, and goes before God and makes us perfect. And because of that, God does not condemn us to spend eternity away from him or totally disconnected in hell. Can you imagine, like, once again, being separated for God, from God for all eternity? Oh my gosh, that would be absolutely devastating. We don't really think about what it would be like to be separated from God completely with him not there at all. It would just, I mean, talk about your worst day ever times, well, eternity, I guess. So God gave you a gift, and it can't be taken away. Okay, I'm not saying, I know there's two camps. You can lose your salvation, you can't lose. I'm not saying you can't lose it, I'm not saying you can lose it. What I am saying is, do you want to try? Do you want to test it out? Just to see what would happen. I think that makes, I think that gives us a serious problem. I don't. So now that we defined that Jesus loves us and called for us to be children of God the Father through him, and we know all we have to do is follow him to have life with him for eternity, why don't we explore what it looks like in real life? And so I want to share another story uh, because I like the visuals and it helps me to get through my sermon to relate something. Uh, I mean, and the story I want to kind of share is like, how did I get here? I mean, really right here, right now on this stage. How did I come to this point being associate pastor? (laughs) Getting up in front of a room full of people was never a fun thing for me. I have stage fright. I mean, Tim, you know, right? Almost thrown up. But God gives me the courage and the strength to do it. Yeah. And so, in the beginning before, or when I became a believer, there was no way you would have gotten me up here. I would have ran. But people prayed for me, and it happened. Thanks, Scotty. And thank you, too. You, you all prayed for me today, I know. But a little while after I was saved, I was asked to lead a Bible study. And I was like, no, I'm sorry. There's no way I'm going to get in front of a room full of people and try to teach them about God, who I don't even really know yet, completely. But somebody prayed for me, and guess what had happened? And then somebody asked me, well, you're going to go to college for a ministry degree, right? I'm like, right. That ain't happening. I got work, I got no resources, I got a family, I got kids. You know, I mean, there's no way. But somebody prayed for me. And that happened. So that's crazy. And then, that was Dennis Corley. And Tim Bycroft, both of them, asked me to be on leadership development to learn about how to be a leader. And I was like, well, and then to be on leadership team. And then to be a pastor. Well, I tell you what, I've learned that when I say no to God, yeah, dot, dot, dot. You already know the ending of that one. But for, for someone like me who has serious ADHD, I know you guys didn't know that about me, and stage fright to get up and do this or to move forward with any part of ministry for God, that's fanatical, Right? That's crazy. And so for those of you out there who are using excuses like you don't have the skill, the knowledge, the courage, the resources, or whatever excuse you're going to use, you can do it. God will, if he calls you to this, and I guarantee he's calling you to a ministry of some sort, he will equip you fully for the task at hand. Right? I mean, God's not going to say, hey, I want you to go do this. He doesn't do that. He gives you the resources, everything you need. Just move, move forward in full trust that through Jesus, 
You can do it. And once again, back to my original story, my question to you is, are you a fully devoted follower running with Jesus, or are you just out taking a walk and he happens to be in the vicinity? Jesus says, believe and you will be saved. He also says, believe, be baptized, and be saved. And once again, he says, confess your sins, believe in me, trust in me, be baptized, and okay, you need to change your direction and come toward me, repent. It's a churchy word that just means come on back to me. And he also then told his disciples to go out and make more disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and go make more disciples. That's what we're supposed to do. This is how you build up the kingdom of God. So if you are not sure that you are saved, if you're not sure that you're fully connected with Jesus, I need you to come talk to one of us today because it is way too important to let go. You don't know, life is short. Life is extremely short, especially through this COVID thing, right? You don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow or the next minute, let alone 10, 20 years from now. It's like, oh, I got time. I don't wanna scare you, but you may not. You don't know it. So come and talk to somebody and let's get this worked out. And for those of you who sense God calling you, what is it that you sense him calling you to do? Is it just picking up the Bible? Is it helping somebody? Is it stepping into ministry? Okay, yes it is, stepping into ministry. I don't mean you have to become a pastor and get up here and preach or whatever. What I am saying is that if you're a Christian, ministry is everything you do. It's all ministry-based to somebody else and especially ministry to God. And so, maybe your first step is sitting down, just reading the Bible, just picking it up daily for a few minutes a day. After all, that's how you get to know who he really is. Maybe you're already there, and you have a gift that God has given you. And so why would he do that? To use it. Don't throw it away. I know that sounds a little confrontational. It probably is, but I was there. I can speak to that because that was me. 1 Corinthians 14.1 says that you should pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. Actually, pursue and desire both of those. Spiritual gifts? I mean, what is that? There's a lot of stuff that God can use to edify his church and build, build the rest of us up. And that's part of being fanatical for God. Consider God more important than anything, and consider others more important than yourself. This is being fanatical. This is picking up your cross and taking on Jesus' yoke. This is loving God and loving others, and this is how you start to become fully devoted, fanatical believers in Jesus Christ. And I think somebody was not watching the uh, screen out there. Y'all out there, you're supposed to be up here. I might have taken a little bit longer, but uh, somebody better go get them. <laughs> well, why don't we finish in prayer and uh, just think about this today. Uh, it's so important. Heavenly Father, we love you. Uh, you have given us everything in our lives. We think we have done something in our life, but everything that we have accomplished could not have been done without you. You have given us your Holy Spirit. You've given us your Son to die for us so that we might not spend eternity in hell, but have eternity with you. And Father God, we love you so much because you've loved us first. We wouldn't even know what that was like without you. And so, Father, I'm asking today that you touch hearts and minds and lead those people that need to know you closer to you. Lead them to somebody in their lives that needs to speak truth into their life to show each one of us what you truly want. Father, we, we love you and we just ask uh, all these things in your name and uh, ask that you just bless the band on this last couple of songs. We love you. Amen.
Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you here today. My name is Riley. I'm one of the elders and pastors here at the Point Church. Uh, welcome. Great to have you here on a sunny Sunday morning. Um, it is now time for communion. So we here at the Point, we celebrate communion every week, and we do that to honor and remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on that cross. Um, there are tables set up in the front and back, the Jews representing Jesus' blood on the stone, and the uh, Christians representing his body. saying something that uh, that identified with me. Um, I, I was too a believer that uh, you don't need uh, to go to church to believe in Christ. You can be in God everywhere. You can do it from your home. And man, was I wrong. Uh, when, I, when I got uh, saved and gave my life to Christ, when I finally you know, coming here, I understood it. Uh, it's not meant to be lived in a bubble. It's not meant to be just uh, a relationship You have to be there, you know, and experiencing that, you know, coming here to this church, you know, worshiping with these blessed musicians that we've been blessed to have and just are speaking and playing from their heart. It's just, it just overwhelms you and hearing great teaching and just being part of and, and seeing all the, the love that you people have for us and we have it for each other. It's, it's, it's a, it's a community. It's, we want to be here for you. And that's what being in a relationship with Jesus is about being there for people. It's not only for me to get the encouragement and words of advice that I need, but to also be an encourager to people who are struggling, you know, in their lives. So I just wanted to share that with you guys and uh, encourage you to, if you don't have that relationship, please don't keep that uh, to yourself. Love on other people, accept Jesus and, and share that great message. And that's the reason why he died on that cross, to give us hope and to share it with people so they don't uh, end up in, uh, in, in fire and not in heaven, um, separated from God for eternity. We want to grow his kingdom. We want to share that gospel and love on people. So that being said, let's thank God and let's uh, lift our prayers up to him. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for all these people here just coming out and worshiping on you, Father, and listening to your word being spoke and just for, for saving us, for giving us strength, for giving us hope in our lives, Father. May we share the good news that we have with other people who truly, truly need it, Father, so they can be in heaven with us for eternity. Thank you for all that you do for this church and for the people here, Father, and people serving in every way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
sit at home and just hold on to this. He calls us to give it, to send it, to take it into the community. Wow, that was just that was just amazing with everything. We just want to shout out our praise to Jesus. You know, Matt, the other song, Inside Out, that was one of the songs that really, really moved me a lot. That I want to be able to love people and love God from the inside out. Like JC was shown, we we said we just show so much, so many people just what we want them to see. But what God wants us to see, show people is what's inside us. And he wants us to shout out the praise. And I just want to thank you, Matt, and all everybody for the band today for, because that was just awesome. Uh, I'd like to go to prayer, and then we're going to dismiss, if I could. So, dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you, God, for, for the point. I thank you, Lord, for having a place where we can meet safely and securely and worship you. 
Lord, as we go out for this week, just like the songs say, we want to love you from the inside out. And just like that old time song says, we want to let our little light shine, Lord. Even if it's a little kid or an adult, we want to let our light shine for Jesus. We just thank you for all this, God, in your name. Amen. Thank you. Come back again next week. We'll look forward to seeing you.